Good afternoon and welcome to the latest installment of our BBB webinar series. I'm your host today, I'm Ben Spradling, and I am really excited about today's topic, Edelman 2021 Trust Barometer, the role of business in rebuilding trust. I'll introduce you to our expert speakers here in just a minute, but before I do that, I wanted to go over some housekeeping items for those who may be joining us for the first time. Resources like today's webinar, those are made possible by BBB accredited businesses. Those are businesses that have taken a pledge to act with integrity and really uphold BBB's eight standards of trust. We really wanna thank them today for their dedication to furthering BBB's mission of creating a marketplace where buyers and sellers can really trust each other. I, um, I also want to remind you that these webinars are available on our YouTube channel. You can find the link to that channel in the chat box, uh, which can be accessed by selecting the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And since you're looking at that chat button already, find the Q&A button located right next door. During today's presentation, you have an opportunity to ask questions. Submit those in the Q&A box at any time, and we'll res uh, reserve the last 10 minutes or so to answer those. Uh, you also have the ability to upvote any of the questions that are submitted um, if they're more relevant to you. So please don't hesitate to look at the other questions that are being asked because we will be asking questions based on the number of upvotes they receive. With uh, all that housekeeping taken care of, I am really excited to introduce you to today's speakers. Christy Bishop is a global marketing executive with nearly 20 years of expertise in integrated brand marketing and communications. As a vice president and group head of Edelman Los Angeles's integrated brand team, Christy looks uh, after a 40 plus um, integrated comms uh, leaders dedicated to the success of brands, including the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau, PayPal, Sunkist, Petco, Dolby, Microsoft, Nestle, and others. Together, their contributions and client counsel have resulted in strong employee morale, client satisfaction, and record growth. Prior to joining Edelman in 2019, Christy served as U.S. Head of Strategy and Analytics and General Manager for Spark 44 Los Angeles, a joint venture responsible for all global marketing and communications for Land Rover, Range Rover, and Jaguar brands. Uh, Christy is joined today by Charlotte Bruner, who has 14 years of experience leading accounts across a variety of verticals, including travel and tourism, CPG, entertainment and energy. Uh, as a senior vice president in Edelman Southern California's integrated brand marketing group, Charlotte builds integrated campaigns for her clients with a focus on shaping brand stories to meaningfully connect with consumers across channels. For the past five years, she's overseen Edelman's Hawaii tourism account, spearheading strategy and execution of integrated programming to drive tourism from within the United States to Hawaii. Her former clients include Destination Canada, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, ABC Family Freeform, Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria, Hyundai, Munchkin, Murad, uh, Samsung, and Shell Oil Company. Uh, Crystal, Christy, excuse me, and Charlotte, thank you again for joining us today. I will turn the stage over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you to everyone for having us. We're really looking forward to the presentation. Uh, before we get into it, I should mention that this data is, it could not be more hot off the press. It was actually released today. <laughs> so what you're going to see is uh, is data that is brand new, but also a conjunction of data that um, was released five months ago. So you're going to see a shift from time over time. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, I'll just give you an overview of what you're going to see. So the Communication from myself and Charlotte today, these are not our opinions. These are not things that we're just popping on to share with you because it's what we think or believe. These, this data is from um, an, actually 21 years ongoing, which I'll get into on the next slide. But what we're looking at today is the spring update of the Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, and the thematic around this one is a world in trauma. Is it the most uplifting thing? No. Is it uh, re realistic with a lot of implications for business? Absolutely. So hence why we're here. So just as you keep in mind as we go through the population, this survey was done online in 14 countries, which you can see on the left from Brazil and Canada to Germany, India, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, South Korea, uh, Japan, Mexico, UAE, UK and US and others. Uh, in total, there were 16,800 plus respondents from the global perspective. There was 1,200 respondents per country. So it was an even split. And everything that you're seeing today was actually fielded, meaning put out into the world for people to take that survey between April 30th and May 11th. Now that is the survey you're gonna to see today. You're gonna to see references to January, 2021. That data um, is collected, was collected between October and November. So you're gonna see the swing in results. Um, the other thing you're gonna to see today is a reference to two different audiences. The first one is informed public, and the second one is mass population or general population. The way that we're defining the informed public, 
There were 100 respondents in each country across those 14 countries. They represent 19% of the total population, total global population, excuse me, of who we spoke to. And they need to meet four criteria. The first one is between the ages of 25 and 64. Second one is they must be college educated. The third is that they have to be in the top 25% of household income per age group in each country between that 25 to 64 split. And the, perhaps the most important thing is they need to report significant media consumption and engagement in public policy and business news. So the informed public, they're people who are they're keeping up with government news, with business news, with media news to keep themselves informed and educated. On the other side, you just have mass population and that's everyone else. And that represents the 80%. So again, as we move forward, just, just keep those two things in mind. So I mentioned that this is the 21st year of Edelman's Trust Barometer and we started in 2001 and these swings have been really incredible. There's four different things that we measure within the Trust Barometer. It's trust in business, trust in NGO, which is nonprofit, trust in media and trust in government. So as we go across time, you've seen in 2001, the first year of the study, rising influence of NGOs or nonprofits. Then you get to things like 2005, you see trust shifting from authorities or government or business to peers, like-minded individuals like, like me, um, or who I would perceive to be like myself. Then you get to 2009, trust in business plummets. But then you go back to go to 2014, business comes back, starts to lead the debate for change. Between six, 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20, and 21, you start to see a growing inequality of trust. Then you start to see trust in crisis. Um, you see misinformation, you start to see the, the uh, surgence of fake news, then you start to see polarization in the battle for trust and the battle for truth. Then you start to see trust at work, what competence and ethics means, and that leads to this year. And what we're going to talk about is declaring information bankruptcy and how do we get out of that and why it's so critical for business and local business in particular to, to lead the way. So the first section we're going to cover is a state of trust as it stands literally today. And what we're seeing thus far is, is what we're calling an unequal recovery. And that unequal recovery is really between those two audiences that I mentioned, the informed public and the mass population. So the easiest way to read this slide, I'm just going to tell you a story so you don't have to dig into the numbers. What we see is a double digit trust gap across institutions. I mentioned the four institutions before that we survey, trust in business, trust in NGO or nonprofit, trust in government and trust in media. The big number on the left, there are two of them. You see 70 and you see 53. The, there's a double digit gap between the trust in these four institutions amongst the informed public, people who are keeping up with public policy news, government news, news in general, business news. They consider themselves educated and informed versus the mass population. So you see the top, there's a split. You see trust in business is up 4% amongst informed public. It's up one, or excuse me, one point, four points, not percent. Uh, trust in nonprofits is up one point to 71. Trust in government has stayed flat. And trust in media is up one, one point to 64. But when you look at the bottom amongst mass population, you'll see that trust is very neutral, which is that light blue color. And you'll see that trust is actually down amongst media, which is the red. So you're seeing this, we talked about a K-shaped recovery. We're seeing that as well with the informed public and the mass population. Now, when we talk about government, um, what we saw in the last study um, and across the last year, a trust bubble burst for government. And that continues today. So government is not trusted in 10 of 14 countries that we surveyed. The red is distrust, the neutral is that light blue, and the, the trust is the dark blue. So within the box of the red and the neutral, you see South Africa, Japan, Brazil, Mexico, South Korea, US, France, the UK, Germany, and Canada reporting mistrust or neutral trust in government. The only um, government that actually received trust from their, uh, their citizens is India, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and China. So it's, that's a, a, an epidemic for government trust. But what is trusted, which is why it's so important for this audience today, for everyone watching, is that my employer is the most entrusted institution. Now, I want to be very clear about what my employer means versus business. So for me, my employer is Edelman. I trust the communications coming from Edelman around what is happening around the pandemic, around safety, around upskilling, because it's the most familiar to me. That's different than saying, my friend works for Verizon. 
I don't trust Verizon. They might trust Verizon because it's their employer. I trust Edwin. So the I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. So my employer, and that leads to all of your employees within your own organizations and businesses is the most trusted. And that's up two points from January. Business in general and business leadership and implications for CEOs and business leaders overall is also up two, but there's a neutral trust for nonprofits, government, and media. So in the next section around the pandemic legacy, unfortunately, we're not out of the pandemic yet, and there's a lot of fear about what's to come. And this is a global look at on what we're calling a world awash in fear. 12 of 14 countries are still in a pandemic mindset. Now, this is not to say that there's absolutely not optimism as we're coming out of this. Vaccinations are taking hold, but obviously it's varying by, from country to country. You look at what's happening in Canada versus what's happening in the US and where we were six months ago. It flip-flops very quickly. So we asked people within each of those 14 countries, which best describes how you're feeling? 65%, this is a global wrap-up number, 65% said, I'm still in a pandemic mindset. If you swing that to the other end of that spectrum, we also ask people to say, do you feel that the pandemic is largely behind us and that you're taking advantage of every opportunity to get back to your pre-pandemic life as quickly as possible? The answer for most people is no. And looking at the US since March, just two months ago, the US sees an 11 point decline in pandemic mindset, which is great. We were at 67, now we're at 56. So you see incremental uh, uh, declines in that pandemic mindset, but it's still very much there. This is true amongst the vaccinated as well. Um, uh, Charlotte and I live in Los Angeles and I just read last, last night that Los Angeles will be um, getting to herd immunity within by July which is incredible. However, herd immunity from a perception perspective still doesn't mean everyone's ready to get out there, particularly if you've been vaccinated. So even the vaccinated don't feel safe resuming normal activities like they did before. So we prompted people with the question, which would or do you feel safe doing right now? And among those who have been fully vaccinated, just over half feel safe shopping in stores, just half feel uh, safe going to doctor's offices, Going to their workplace, 37, it takes a dip. Dining indoors, another dip to 35. Staying at hotels, sending your kids to school, using public transportation and flying commercial airlines, all dip within less than one third of respondents feeling comfortable doing those things after they've been vaccinated. So you can see the trickle down effect to the economy. If people are not going out to restaurants, if they're not comfortable staying in hotels, if they're not comfortable sending their kids to school, going back out into the world on public transport or traveling, no matter how much they might want to, the desire versus the action are very different. So I, I think we'll see this change over time, but as it stands today, people fully vaccinated are, are still not quite comfortable yet. So as we think about the impact of the pandemic and thinking about just mindset overall, there are two things that are really, there's, there's five, but there's two things that are really rising to the top in terms of what people believe will be the worst negative consequences of the pandemic. The first one is mental health problems. Now we have seen, I'm sure everyone on this call has seen across the board, an increase in mental health related news, things around self-care, things around burnout. There was just a, a study from the WHO two days ago about burnout and overworking, literally killing people. So it's very prevalent in the news at the moment. And it's very much on people's minds as we continue through this pandemic. The second thing, which continues to contribute to that mental health uh, crisis is lost jobs. And again, as we've seen this K-shaped recovery, people who have lost their jobs, which leads to potentially losing their homes, financial ruin, not being able to take care of their family. It's a huge, huge crisis for people. So those two things are really the, the biggest things that people are afraid are not going to get better. And it's what's most on their mind. The other thing I just mentioned, losing homes and financial ruin, a worsening of economic disparities, which we're seeing uh, particularly amongst uh, people of color. Um, and falling behind in their education among a youth mindset and uh, younger generations, there's a lot of work to be done. And this is where you come in, which we'll get into in a bit. So mental health is one thing, job loss is another thing. The third thing that is absolutely on people's minds, and this has skyrocketed to the top, it was not this way five months ago, is climate change. So as we've seen these supply chain issues, we've seen hacking, 
Uh, we just saw Colonial Pipeline last week get hacked in terms of the, uh, the gas line on the East Coast. But the impact of climate change, um, the West Coast fires, we in California and Colorado have had uh, fires this early in the year already. People are saying, and they, they believe that climate change needs to be taken more seriously as a threat to human life. Uh, the black people, 46% believe it's always been true. And 24% believe because of the pandemic, I've now, I'm now led to believe that this is true. So it's a total of 70. The information crisis, similar numbers, it's down 64, but 30 have always believed this is an issue. 34 now believe it's an issue. So a large jump. And thinking about the, like the Suez Canal crisis, uh, I believe just last month, they believe that the US and their, their own uh, countries are too reliant on other countries for essential products. So they're, they're seeking independence. And in additional, not great news, but people were not out of this pandemic. And so now that it's happened, nearly seven in 10 fear another pandemic. People are concerned about another global pandemic worse than COVID-19. For the US in particular, 61% are concerned and 33% are fearful. If you look at that global wrap up, that's very in line with the 67% overall, the aggregate globally, um, who are concerned and the 38% who are fearful. Um, the most, if, it's interesting, if you look at the countries who are most concerned and most fearful, look at Brazil and you look at the COVID-19 response. Same with Mexico. South Korea had an excellent response in the beginning, but has seen a resurgence in cases. Obviously the devastation in India, right? And then you go to the other side, you see Japan, Germany, China, and the US, um, and, and Canada to a certain extent, where you see the, the response has been um, much more responsible and much more uh, impactful in helping to, um, to reduce the number of COVID cases. And overall, when we talk about who, this is where we get to, to everyone on this call. So key societal leaders are not trusted. So on the left, religious leaders, there's a wild distrust amongst religious leaders in the agenda. Government leaders, not far off. Um, although it is, it is neutral, it's gone up six points. Journalists, it's gone up to 50, still neutral. Before, they were mistrusted. Business CEOs, still neutral, but it's gone up. Before, there was a dearth in their trust as well. On the right-hand side, where people look to for trust, my employer. And just because it says my employer, my employer CEO is the only trusted societal leader, you do not have to be a CEO. A CEO is, is the equivalent of a, of a small business owner, right? It's who's at the top of that organization who has um, responsibility for one employee or 10,000 employees. It's that business leader overall, that's what's trusted. So my employer CEO is at nine to 72 and also on the other side, experts. So experts are at five points, 77 trust scientists and experts in their field. And at the moment, there's no end to the infodemic and communications is critical here. So five months ago, there's four things we're looking at here. We're seeing trust in search engines, trust in traditional media, trust in owned media, so websites, um, company owned websites and social media. Last time of this, this uh, study was done, there was no trust in anything. The trust in news sources now from January to May, still at record lows, but only owned media has gained in trust and it's up three points. So it's not, it's not a huge jump, but given where you can see the drop off in that box, a significant drop, um, drop in trust in any information source. The fact that owned media, again, the business owned media is starting to climb up. It shows the, ne the uh, necessity for businesses to act and lead the way. Employer media in terms of communication, so my employer media, the things that Edelman is telling me about the pandemic, again, about upskilling, about safety, about a return to work, employer media is the most believable. So the percent of people who believe information from each source automatically or after seeing it twice or left, less, look at the left-hand side in that box, communications from my employer, 59% of people believe that. So, so 48%, if they see it once or twice, they will believe it. If, and in the black box, if I see it here, I will automatically assume it's true. There's only, it's very, very low for the eight points of, I will never believe it's true if this is the only place I see it. I have to see things other places. But my employer by leaps and bounds is what people trust for information. It starts to go down after that for national government, media reports, um, major corporations of business in general, advertising, 
media reports with anonymous sources, and then social media. So this is where you come in and the communications to your employees um, is going to be the most impactful for them and uh, make a difference in their lives. And beyond my employer, the other ones, the other um, uh, contingencies who are seen as most credible, experts, peers, employer CEOs, those three, in addition to my employer CEO, those are the people that, that people are trusting the information coming from them. So a company technical expert, an academic expert, remember we were talking about scientists before, a person like yourself, so like-minded peer, um, because if, if you are out there doing research on business, doing research on the news, doing research on public policy and government, and your peers are as well, you're much more likely to trust them because you have a similar mind mindset. On the right-hand side, CEOs, board of directors, um, any NGO or nonprofit representatives, regular employees, government officials, or journalists, a lot of these, maybe with perhaps with the exception of regular employee, might be seen as having an agenda. They, they definitely suffer from a lack of trust. And when we think about communications in general and overall information literacy and how people consume information, only one in four people and one in four respondents of this survey report that they have good information hygiene. So what does that mean? Information hygiene is uh, the level of news engagement. How often are you actually um, interacting with the news and searching for it and digesting it? Um, are people avoiding information echo chambers? For example, do you go on Facebook or Twitter and you're only served the algorithm of like-minded people who are saying the exact same thing as you? Or do you go to the other side as uncomfortable as it might be or new um, and actually immerse yourself in that to understand a full perspective. Third, do you verify information or are you just passing it along because it's interesting and maybe maybe salacious, maybe fun. And number four, do you not to not amplify unvetted information, right? So unfortunately, like I said, one in four only have good information hygiene and 57% of, of respondents share or forward news items that they find to be interested interesting, but they haven't verified them. And of those people, only 29% say that they have good information hygiene. And I believe the last thing for me, so the priorities for consumers have shifted. With information literacy, it, it's, it matters more than it's ever mattered before because the changes in people's lives are so drastic. So when we think about the changes since the start of the year, start of 2021, um, the changes in priorities for people have taken the survey, the net change, top, prioritizing my family and their needs, particularly as lockdowns have happened, as remote work has happened, as everything has been stripped away from people's lives and what they know they need to focus on is the power of family and relationship, that's what they want to take care of. Um, it's increased by 56 Increasing my media and information literacy, making sure that I'm more educated and understanding what's going on in the world so I'm not fed fake news, or if I am, I can identify and realize, nope, uh -uh, not paying attention to that. That's gone up 46. And increasing my science literacy is up 43. So you see these really important things happening. Uh, nope, next slide. And now I'll pass it over to Charlotte to take it into uh, implications as to what it really means for each of your businesses. Thanks, Christy. Um, so Christy's been talking a lot about, you know, the, the rise of my employer and the trust in my employer, excuse me. Um, so I wanted to just, you know, dig into more, what does this mean for business? And the reality is that there's a new mandate for business um, greater than ever before to take action. Um, you know, consumers and employees in the communities are no longer letting um, companies and businesses just stand on the sidelines and not do anything. And it has to feel authentic and it can't be performative. And so we want to help really zero in on what are the issues that matter and what are these increased expectations for businesses that, so that you really can, you can, this presentation can feel actionable for you um, in your day to day as business leaders. So there's this increased pressure for businesses to take on societal challenges because people really believe that, you know, government and the other institutions that Christy was referencing aren't really able to tackle a lot of the challenges that the pandemic has set for us. And so you need to really critically think through um, what are you doing, um, you know, to stand up and, you know, take a stand on some of these societal challenges and really show up again for your key audiences from employees to consumers uh, to the community. 
And to take that one step further, you know, as the most trusted institution, um, you know, really employees and consumers and in your communities on um, which you operate are really expecting business leaders specifically to fill that void. And as Christy mentioned, when we say CEOs, you know, you can typically it goes to big corporations and companies, but really it's the small and mid-sized companies, which is relevant for all of you on this call that have this great influence on the communities in which you operate. And there's this level of trust and loyalty um, to you know, business leaders within the smaller companies um, and within these local businesses to really be paving the way as we come out of this pandemic and leading change and not just being accountable um, to stock, you know, stockholders and boards of directors and internal stakeholders, but really taking the public's opinion and their employees' opinion in mind as you're making key decisions um, coming out of, well, in, within and coming out of this pandemic. And as we look at the issues that matter to your employees, what we're seeing here, 80% of employees expect their employer to take action. And you'll see that's from vaccine hesitancy to automation to racism. There needs to be some action in place. And we don't want this to feel like it's all on you and that this should be a one-sided discussion because it absolutely should not be. You should be having conversations with your employees to understand of this list that we have here, what matters most to them. This should be a dialogue. And some will rise to the top for some of your companies and others maybe don't matter as much. Certainly these are all very important across the board, but you can tailor it based on what makes most sense for you to act on when it comes to societal issues. So we wanted to dive in a little bit specifically into racism response. Um, we all know the last year was a, a year of racial reckoning with um, the murders of Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the attacks on the Asian um, Pacific Islander community. And so we just need to think through um, or encourage you to think through how are you responding to what's happened? And you'll see here the employer is the most trusted institution on that response. We know this can quickly become a politically charged issue, but it shouldn't be. What, we, what we're saying is this is a humanity issue and you need to be thinking about how this directly impacts your employees. And again, how are you having that two-way dialogue with them on what matters to them related to this issue? Because it really matters um, that you're showing up in some way. You can't just stay silent anymore. And you can see that if done well, you really stand to gain trust you know, with all of your, um, you know, key uh, external um, and internal stakeholders. So you'll see that, you know, if you do it right, trust bumps up, but the stakes are high. So if you don't do it right, then you stand to lose trust quite quickly. So it's something that you need to think through thoroughly. And again, it can't feel performative. So you have to deliver on any promises that are made or any statements that are made or communications that come out, but um, something needs to be done. You just can't, can't do nothing. And this is really interesting that we saw that, you know, it also directly impacts your business. So four in 10 uh, per uh, survey um, participants would avoid employers that fail to take a stand against racism. So, you know, we've, so we actually did a, a recent study um, with Microsoft where we saw one, one in four Gen Z and millennials are looking for new jobs as is um, this year. You know, I think people are coming out of the pandemic refreshed and just Kind of thinking like what's the next step for my career um, no matter what industry that they're in and so this will be a factor that they keep in mind um, and obviously racism isn't the only thing that matters in terms of issues that matter to them but it's really something that needs to be top of mind um, because it is we are seeing that this could happen so like i said racism isn't the only issue and christy has touched on you know some other societal issues that matter but Want to just talk to talk through a little bit you know how can you continue to gain that trust so if they're expecting more of businesses what else matters and you know christy talked a lot about the the infodemic and just the lack of you know trustworthy information so one of the key ways you can really step up is being that guardian of information quality and giving your employees um which will trickle that into the community consistent and thorough um and truthful information um, that they feel like they can rely on and they don't feel like they're getting swayed one or the other and it's neutral and it's all that, but it's really important to step in and be that source of trusted information from them. 
And then the others that you'll see on here, um, you know, embracing sustainable practices, um, driving economic prosperity, thinking long term. So a lot of this is related to do, you know, do your key audiences feel like they can trust you both now and into the future? And how are you protecting their current careers, but also how are you preparing them for um, what future life will be as we come out of this pandemic, whenever that fully is, um, you know, six months plus down the road, because we know the implications will you know, carry through for a while here. And as we think, we wanted to get a little bit more specifically to talk about employee expectations, um, because they are such a, a key audience for you. So, you know, we surveyed and found that as employees thought about employer attributes that really matter, um, the ones that really like rose to the top of the list were keeping workers and customers safe, which is not surprised in a, a pandemic um, from like a health perspective, your know, job skills and training programs. So we've all seen, you know, because of the pandemic, a lot of businesses have had to go more digital. And there's new skills that a lot of businesses um, and employees have had to adopt into their daily practices in order to, you know, stay afloat during this pandemic and remain, you know, successful and all that. And some people have been laid off, but are getting brought back on and it's just a whole new world for them. So how are you ensuring that you are putting in place training programs so that people feel like they actually can show up to work and do a good job. They don't feel like they're falling behind. Um, again, back to being that guardian of information and equality um, immigration quality, excuse me, uh, those regular employee uh, communications. So that transparency and just having a frequency of those communications coming out and even going as far as to putting your employee communications on your website, you know, if you have one, because then the communities can see what your, your, your um, the information you're sharing directly with your workforce as well. And then finally, um, having a diverse and representative workforce. So this is certainly becoming more and more important. So how are you ensuring that you are keeping diversity in mind um, when you are hiring, um, when you are hiring uh, people um, onto your teams and um, for your businesses? So this was um, interesting to see it and certainly not surprising because um, we keep talking about employees, employees, employees. But what we saw with the latest um, trust cut was that you've seen a flop in the importance of uh, customers and clients um, versus employees. So employees are now the most important stakeholder that you have and really will be key to achieving long term success. So your employees you know, need to be at the table with you um, for key decisions and need to be heard. And there's just increased, you know, um, expectation that they will be. In fact, you know, we see that employees and consumers really expect to have that seat at the table. Um, you know, 68% of consumers, 62% of employees, they really feel like they have the power to force corporations and um, businesses of all sizes to change. So it's not just enough to hear your employees, as you're making key decisions, you really need to ensure that you have them at the table and their voices are being heard and being reflected in your practices and policies. Because as you'll see on the right side here, you know, with this, you know, increased expectation to have a seat at the table, there's this increased, um, you know, desire to to activate for their rights. And that we've seen this outside of the outside of business and inside of business, there's just more of this desire for activism and fighting for what you think is right, no matter what the issue may be. And so it's really important that they're feeling heard. And wanted to end before we get into kind of key takeaways, because I know we've gone through a lot, just to say that there is hope and I know that, you know, Christy was showing some little increases in, you know, sentiment of being in the pandemic mindset, but people were very much still there. But all that to say, and was, you know, loved seeing this, 64% feel that the pandemic will lead to valuable innovations and changes for the better in how we live, work, and treat each other. So I think that's just, I know this is, you know, we've talked through a lot of pressure on business and you need to be driving change and you, you can't stay silent anymore. And there's a lot of loaded topics like climate change and racism, et cetera, but want to just like underscore that there is an end in sight and we'll all come out of this better. Um, and businesses should really look at this as an opportunity of how to shape your business for the better moving forward and really keep you know your employees and your consumers and the communities in mind um, to be more reflective of you know, diverse viewpoints 
and what really um, what's really expected um, from the, those key audiences. So to wrap it up, and then we can start, I know that I've been seeing some um, questions um, pop up, getting alerts, um, but we wanted to just distill for you, what does this mean? Um, we hope this feels actionable. Um, you know, like I said, there's, there is this increased expectation for business. The first point here that we wanted to call out is you're not expected to solve every societal problem that came because of the pandemic or just that's, you know, increased um, or brought to light more issues because of the pandemic. It just, you need to be there showing that you're trying to make a difference and that you're taking a stance. So, and it, it, you do need the help of those other institutions, you know, media and government NGOs to do that with you. So as we move to two, what we'd love for you to think about is where does it make sense for you to really jump in and to lead where you have expertise? So is that jobs? Is it training? Is it wages and innovation? Where can you show up? And again, it has to be that authentic action. So where does it make sense for you to plug in? And then you need to continue to take action on inclusion and sustainability. Again, can't underscore enough like the authenticity because if it does feel performative, you'll get called out and that's not what we want. Um, but it just is a way to think about not feeling you have to tackle everything that we've presented here, but to really zero in what makes most sense for your business. Um, number three here, again, employees are your most important stakeholder. So how are you inviting them into those conversations where you're making key decisions? How are you having that two-way dialogue? How are you understanding what societal issues really matter to them? And then how are you implementing that change with them? So this is just really, I, this is probably the most important on here, I would say, because it just matters so much that you're making your employees feel heard. And again, this trickles out to the community. So if your employees feel heard, you know, they're going to be telling family and friends in the community and it just, it gives, it increases the trust that your audiences have, um, you know, with you as a business. And finally, um, you know, again, a lot that needs to be done. Don't want you to think government is off the hook here. So government definitely needs to lead on foundational challenges. So this, when it comes to, you know, vaccination or return to workplace, and certainly these are topics and issues that you need to, you know, have a POV on and need to be having conversations with people on. Um, this is still the responsibility of government. So again, like, don't want you to think that everything we presented today is on business to completely solve. It's just that you need to be stepping up because you are trusted and it's really an opportunity for you to be building more trusted relationships with, um, you know, the people that matter most to your business. And with that, um, I am going to close the presentation. I think we're gonna to move to some Q&A. Yeah, Charlotte and Christy, thank you both very much for that information. That was very, very insightful. And I'm positive that all our attendees uh, were able to fully understand the opportunity that they have as uh, small business owners right now. Um, I did want to uh, spotlight the questions that we did get already. If um, anyone still has some questions they would like to submit, we have time to do that. But otherwise, I will roll right into some of the ones that we have gotten already. Um, we got one question. As employers have so much on their plate right now, where can they turn to help facilitate the conversation? How, how can they have that conversation with their employees? That's a great question, knowing that there are so many small businesses out there who are just, just grinding every single day. And it's hard enough to think about hiring someone if you lose someone much less have these really difficult conversations. The bottom line is if you don't have these conversations, unfortunately, what we've seen from the research is that there's gonna be specific and fairly could be negative impacts on your business um, from a community perspective or the word of mouth from employees internally. So um, I, would, I would hope that, you know, the Better Business Bureau was a great resource for everyone on this call, as, as could Ed, Edelman could also be as well. We have so many clients that come to us to help facilitate that conversation and also just to educate on the best ways to do that, the right questions to ask, the right uh, commentary to have, to make sure that it's it's clean and clear and unbiased. Um, so I would imagine to get in touch with your, your Better Business Bureau rep as well. And then um, it also goes to another question, if you don't mind, Ben, to just jump right to, how should businesses respond to racism with their staff and their customers without offending every, anyone? Have a two-way dialogue. It's what Charlotte said, it's not on you. 100% to have that conversation and to bring in your personal perspective. 
keep this neutral, but ask them what they need. Uh, we've sat down with so many different clients in their internal employee groups, um, whether it's literally the employees or doctors that they work with or, or staff at a restaurant to facilitate a two-way dialogue around how are they feeling? What experiences have they had in the past? Their lifelong journey has been very, very different than people who come from positions of power and privilege. So how do they actually facilitate that conversation and listen first, then take what they hear and change policy? or start to advocate something in the community, change something on a menu, change an offering from a product or a service perspective, and also change HR policies. Just change the discussion, even just opening that door to dialogue, it results in so much more trust and such positive impact amongst your employees, which leads to loyalty, which leads to retention of, of, um, of that staff and also potential recruitment because you get a great uh, reputation within the community. That's a really great point. We, um, we got one other question that asks, because media scored so low with trust, do you think that third party interviews are more trusted? And the example they gave were maybe a, a BBB interview that you could see in a news segment. You know, we, we can't say because we didn't research that specific thing. So I, I don't want to actually say with any sort of credibility around third party interviews. Um, but I would say in terms of media, think about media or any, any research that's put out there from a third party perspective, that is often much more credible because it doesn't serve a specific media focused agenda. So if there's actually um, research such as what we've shared with you today that has a large um, recruitment respondent base, so you can see results that are statistically significant, you can see findings that actually are, are representative of the, not just the geography that you're looking for, but the different types of groups you're looking to talk to, um, you can often, you, you can most times trust that type of research. Um, but third party is typically much more neutral, just speaking um, anecdotally, than specific media. I, I think the other interesting point around the media is the echo chamber that I mentioned earlier today. It's really, really important for everyone, no matter how often you're looking at the news or not, to, and no matter how uncomfortable it might be or something you don't agree with, just to expose yourself to what's different. Mm -hmm. and, and you might be like, wow, that is, that is not what I believe in. But it's education. Mm -hmm. And in order for everyone to come together, and like Charlotte said, there's so much hope coming out of this pandemic, but business and government and NGOs and media, everyone has to partner together in this. Consumers and employers and employees have to partner together in this. And you know what, if one of those institutions doesn't um, behave in an above board manner, like Charlotte shared, consumers and employees are going to force that to happen. So no one is off the hook, but the bottom line is everyone has to work together and we all have to educate ourselves around every, every um, aspect of the, of the wheel in order to move forward in a, uh, an unbiased and, and fair way. One question we got really was asking, how do you get that, the ball rolling? How do, you, how do you facilitate that conversation? It's one thing to know that it needs to happen. How do you, how do you start it in your own workplace? You know, and Charlotte, I certainly don't want to answer all the questions. So by all means, <laughs> by all means jump in too. Um, <laughs> I would say that the best way to start that is if you say you have a second in command, um, someone you really trust in the workplace or someone who you know has really, say, let, let's um, speak to racial injustice for a moment. If you know that there's someone on your staff um, who is a person of color, who's really experienced very, very difficult, um, whether it's youth or just maybe actually, maybe you don't even know what they've experienced. Just ask a question. How are you? How are you doing right now? You know, if you have Asian American employees during the AAPI violence, which has been ongoing, but now just has a media lens on it. How are you? Really? How are you? And open up that door to dialogue. Let them know you're there to support, listen, and ask what they need and use their guidance. Don't come at it like you know all the answers because you don't. And like Charlotte said, this, this is not all on you. Absolutely not. This is a partnership. But I would say, even if you're nervous, and we've had a lot of clients who are nervous or uncomfortable, particularly board of directors who tend to be a bit more Caucasian in nature and male and older in nature, and they, they're very nervous, they don't wanna say the wrong thing. We just encourage them to just open a dialogue, have an employee forum, set up a group um, where you have an, a third party facilitator where you're not doing the talking and just let your people tell you their experiences and show empathy. Empathetic leadership is, is the, uh, the silver bullet right now. And that the trend is very much towards that from a holistic employee perspective. So understand who they are as people, ask them for their experiences, respect those and create um, necessary changes and modifications in your policies 
in order to uh, address the issues that they've been having. You, uh, you, you. Work. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, and I was just gonna say, I saw a question come through about, um, you know, groups of customers disagreeing on issues and certainly that can be reflected in, um, you know, empl like employees coming to you. And I think is you just hearing out both sides and being empathetic, like Christy's saying to both sides of it, um, but also just thinking about your, your business and, you know, the, your internal stakeholder and all that, like what you have to, you want to hear out your employees on both sides, but also think through like, what does your business and your brand want to stand for? Um, Cause it might be scary, but there really needs to be, um, you really need to think through that and um, take a stance. So I know it can be scary and, but it's, it's just something that hopefully as you have more of those dialogue with, com with your employees and with consumers and even the community, you get a better pulse on what really matters and how you want to show up in whatever way that may be. Are there, if, for businesses, are there, are there new resources that you would recommend for credible information that they can share to their employees? For local communities, I would say start with your local local um, business chapters. You know, there's there are things like Nextdoor, <laughs> which are, while they might not be the most pleasant to, to jump on and look at because they are certainly biased depending on who you're listening to, it does give you some sort of pulse on what's happening in the community. But from a, a policy perspective, you could even speak with your local police department about what's happening within the community, understanding the issues, and then local, um, just local um, specific groups. If there's any, like we, we within uh, Edelman and a lot of other companies have like employee network groups, and it will be um, our Black American group and a, a Asian American group, Pacific Islander group, and we'll actually just sit and we have recurring meetings and we sit and we listen. And it's what's going on on the ground with them. Encourage the same exact thing with your, within your uh, communities. Just don't don't be afraid of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. You know, but for business owners, it's very difficult, particularly small business owners who may have customers who are coming in hot, and they're just, hey, I've known you for 35 years, I've been your customer forever, and this is just my, you know, hey Joe, this is I know he's X Y Z. Um, try to be as neutral as you can, but also think about what what Joe might be saying and the impact on one of your employees in the back. What are they hearing? And how are you responding to what somebody is saying when they come in? Think about that. It's that empathy angle too. Um, so I would say local local resources, certainly in your community um, and any just local chapters, but definitely keep an eye out as to what you're saying and how you're responding. Really good point. And I was also gonna just layer in, you know, when it comes to, you know, and this goes back to the final slide on government taking the lead on some of the foundational issues at play you know, lean on your state departments of health, like where these is factual, non-biased information too, because certainly you need to take a stance, but there's certain topics that um, you should just be providing the facts to both your employees and to your customers. And so you can turn to some of those non-biased organizations that put out information on the regular um, to make sure that you know, people feel safe and all that. So that can tend to be like more, you know, the health side or whatnot, but um, certainly even like chambers of commerce and some of those organizations can help and have that like trustworthy, reliable information that's not leaning one way or the other. We, uh, we got one other question. How can businesses keep a finger on the pulse of new information and resources to ensure they're staying updated on the current needs of their employees and their community? I think it's similar to what Charlotte just said. Yeah, and Christy, yeah, I think that kind of answered that one. Yeah. If uh, if no one else has any questions, I want to thank Christy and Charlotte both again very much for joining us today. Uh, we have recorded this webinar. It's available on our uh, uh, BBB Great West and Pacific YouTube page. Um, we will be sending uh, the recorded version of this webinar out as well. Um, so you can uh, share that and revisit it if you would like to do that. Um, I do want to remind everybody that we have our live events page available on our uh, trust-bbb.org uh, site. You can find that on just the online events section of that homepage. Um, we uh, again want to thank um, Charlotte and Christy for, for their time. Uh, if you have any additional questions, um, you can certainly reach out to us and we can um, relay those to, those to them so that they can uh, find some answers for you. But otherwise, thank you again for joining us today and we hope that everyone has a really great afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.